Good morning, and welcome to worship at Zion Lutheran Church. A special welcome to those of you who are watching our live stream. It is Sunday, June 13th, 2021. We have gathered again to worship our Lord Jesus. And this, starting today, rather, this summer, we're going to do something a little bit different in our worship service, and that is that I'm going to be not preaching on one of the selected readings, which we'll be having still in our worship service, but we're going to take a look at the book of Galatians from the beginning to the end. And I'll be preaching on the entire book during the summertime and through September. So you'll have a chance to get very familiar with one of the books of the Bible this particular summer. I'll have more to say about that as we get into the sermon a little bit later today. As we worship our Lord today, we'll follow the order of service that's in your worship folder. And uh, all of the hymns and everything are printed. I have added a hymn in today. We can sing with our masks on, but I added a fourth hymn. So we're kind of getting back to our normal a little bit. And uh, we'll join in singing that hymn after the offering today. So we will have that hymn in addition. You may sing, but uh, do keep your masks on yet today. We will be meeting uh, with the elders on tomorrow night to see what uh, the changes will come after the 15th of June this coming uh, this coming week and see where we are next Sunday. But for today, we'll still continue to wear masks and and distance in our worship service. Let us begin then to worship our Lord with our opening hymn, number 28, Let the Earth Now Praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, 
Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. It is our joy today to hear God speak to us in the words of his Holy Scripture, beginning first with a lesson from the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, reading verses 8 to 15. And as we will see, our theme for this summer is going to be, We Are Free. But as we see here, we find out why we were not free in what happened in the Garden of Eden. We read, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Here ends our first lesson from God's Word. Our second lesson from God's Word takes us to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 1 to 6. And there we hear the fulfillment of that promise that God just gave about Satan and the fulfillment of our freedom through Christ. The Apostle John wrote, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. He had the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the abyss, locked it, and set a seal on it, so that he could no longer deceive the nations until the thousand years came to an end. After this, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and those who were sitting on them were given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast and his image, and they did not receive his mark on their forehead, and on their hand. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years came to an end. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Instead, they will be priests of God and Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Here ends our second lesson from God's Word. Our verse for today, Alleluia, 
God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Alleluia. A gospel lesson for today is recorded for us in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 to 25. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He is possessed by Beelzebul, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll continue our service with the singing of our hymn of the day, number 726, Christ the Lord of hosts unshaken.
As I mentioned, the word of God that we're going to be looking at is from the book of Galatians. And today we look at the first five verses of Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus once said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you hear those words from Jesus, do you perhaps think a little bit like the audience to whom Jesus spoke those words? Free, Jesus? Why would we need to be set free? We're not slaves. We're a free people. We live in the land of the free. Why would we need to be set free? Jesus answered them. He said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. There it is. By nature, we are all slaves because we are all, by nature, sinners. No amount of Napa know-how, no good hands of all state, or anything else can free us from that slavery. Not Pfizer or Moderna or Johnson & Johnson can stop the ultimate end of that slavery in our lives, which is death. But we are no longer slaves. We have been freed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the truth that sets us free. And so we we ought not to continue to live like slaves. And that is the main message of Paul's letter to the people in Galatia. We are free. That's the truth that Luther brought back to the church at the time of the Reformation. In Christ, we are free. And so it's important for us for 16 weeks this summer to listen to the Apostle Paul in one of his most passionate letters as he explains and defends our Christian freedom. Now to start with, we need to back up and get a little background to find out who is Paul writing this letter to? I've got a couple of slides. I'll ask for the first slide to be put up now. Take just a second. We're going to try this. We'll see how it works. We'll have to see how it works for those of you who are watching the live stream as well. This is a map of Paul's first missionary journey, if you can see that. Paul left from over here in Antioch in Syria, and he went by sea over to Asia Minor, what is today modern-day Turkey. And he visited some cities in the lower part of Asia Minor, cities that we've become sort of familiar with, important cities like Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And he visited them so he could proclaim to them the freedom of the gospel. And it was passionate that he was about proclaiming that freedom, even to the point where he risked his life to do it. You might recall that in Lystra, they took stones and pummeled Paul until they thought that they had killed him and left him for dead. Paul got up even after that and went on to Derby and still kept on proclaiming the freedom of the gospel. This was a passion for the Apostle Paul. Second slide, please. This is Paul's second missionary journey. And again, you'll notice that Paul, this time not going through the sea, but he goes by land, but he visits again Asia Minor. 
in this area, and he visits those cities that he had visited, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, and Antioch. But then Luke also tells us in Acts that he also went into the regions of Phrygia and Galatia and preached the gospel there as well. Now, when Luke tells us and uses the word Galatia, he uses it in the book of Acts primarily in an ethnic sense. He's talking about the region where the ethnic Galatians lived, people who had migrated from Central Europe. They were the Celts or the Gauls that once lived in Central Europe. And they had migrated over into this region and settled in the northern part of Asia Minor. Next slide, please. In his third missionary journey, Paul again goes up through this region into Asia Minor, and Luke again tells us that he visited Bithynia and Galatia again. So he's visiting again, making sure that these people are still holding on to that freedom of the gospel that he had proclaimed to them. And then he went on to Ephesus, and he spent three years in Ephesus teaching the gospel there. Ephesus was an important city. It was the capital city of the province of Asia. And that reminds us that when Paul uses the word Galatia, he uses it a little bit differently than Luke does in Acts. Because Paul uses the word Galatia to refer to the Roman province of Galatia, which included not only this ethnic area of Galatia, but also the southern part, which would be where those cities that he had first visited in this area were. So who is the audience to whom Paul is writing? Who received this letter? It was all of these churches that Paul had begun in the southern part and in the ethnic region of Galatia up here. Those were the people that Paul now is writing to at this time. Okay, you can take that out if you will. Now, what had happened in the meantime as Paul had gone over to Ephesus and had left this region is that trouble began brewing for the people in Galatia. And that trouble was brewing because they were infiltrated, these congregations, by a group known as the Judaizers, who likely even came from Jerusalem all the way up to this area. Now, Judaizers were Jews. Remember that these people that Paul had proclaimed the gospel to were primarily Gentiles who became Christians. They hadn't been Jews before. They were Gentiles that became believers in Jesus Christ. But now these Judaizers who are Jews and Christians come in and they began to tell these Gentiles that their salvation doesn't just depend on Jesus. That if they just believe in Jesus, that's not enough. They won't be saved. In order to be saved, they have to believe in Jesus and they have to keep the Jewish laws as well. In essence, then, what these Judaizers were really doing is denying completely the freedom of the gospel that we have in Jesus Christ. The freedom of knowing that through Jesus alone, we are completely and totally redeemed and saved. Now, of course, when these Gentiles first heard that, they likely would have said to these Judaizers, but that's not what Paul taught us. And so a lot of what's in Galatians is also going to be these Judaizers attacking the Apostle Paul, attacking his apostleship, attacking his authority to preach, attacking and saying that his message was inferior to the the message that they had because they came from the apostles in Jerusalem. Well, the Apostle Paul got word of this trouble that was brewing in Galatia. And we don't know for sure whether he was still in Ephesus or if he had gone over to Corinth. We don't know exactly what year Paul wrote this, so we're not exactly sure of the time and the place where Paul penned this letter to the Galatians. But he penned it because he had found out about the troubles, and it was serious. And so Paul wrote this letter, and it's one of his most passionate letters. It's one of his strongest letters. It's more strongly worded than any other letter that he writes. Because the freedom of the gospel is at stake. And he begins right at the start of his letter. Now, when we write a letter in English, we usually put the name of the people we're writing to at the top, and then what do we do? We put our name at the end of the letter, don't we? 
at Paul's time, they didn't write letters that way. They put their name at the very top and then immediately who they were writing to and then maybe a greeting. And so Paul begins this letter very clearly. He says, Paul. He wants them to know who's writing this letter. Paul. The one who had come and preached to them previously. Paul. And then he adds, and those who are with me, which is unusual for Paul because usually he names those who are with him, but he doesn't even name them here. They're just kind of nondescript people because Paul is so agitated. He is so passionate about what he has to say. He practically skips over the other people. This is what he wants to tell them and he jumps almost right into it immediately because immediately he adds the word apostle. Paul, apostle. There's two important things about his saying apostle. The first one is that by doing that, he's identifying himself with the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And secondly, the word apostle comes from the Greek word, which means to be sent. And he's saying that I'm the one who's been sent, sent on a mission, the mission of proclaiming the gospel of freedom. And who was it? that sent him on that mission. Whose mission was he on? Whose gospel was he proclaiming, this gospel of freedom? Well, he immediately adds, he says, not from men and not by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul makes it clear right up front, this isn't his message. It's a divine message. It didn't come from any human being. It is a message that comes from above. And it is the message of the freedom we have in Christ. But Paul even adds something more to that because not only is this a message that has its source in God alone, but Paul didn't hear it from another person. You see, others had that same message. They had it from God. Like Barnabas, his traveling companion, he had that message and he proclaimed it too. But Barnabas received that message by a man. Through other people, he received it from the 12 apostles in Jerusalem. But Paul says here, I did not receive this message by a man. It didn't come from me, from any human being that I learned this message. I learned it from Jesus Christ. And there you can see already, right here in the beginning of his letter, in the greeting already, Paul is already aware of the attacks of those Judaizers. The Judaizers were saying, Paul, you're not an apostle. The Judaizers were saying, your your message is inferior. We bring a more important message to these people. So ignore what Paul says. Listen to us. But Paul says, I didn't receive this by a man. I received this directly from Jesus. When I was on the way to Damascus, Jesus appeared to me. And he taught me the gospel message. And after that, he taught me as well. And then Paul adds to that, not only from Jesus, Jesus, but by God the Father. This message had divine origin and it was spoken to him by God. Not only Jesus, but the Father, because Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so it is God the Father also that gave him this message. God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. His message doesn't come from a dead Savior. His message comes from a living Savior. Savior, whose resurrection marks him as divine, whose resurrection marks his authority, whose resurrection shows that everything he spoke was absolutely the truth. Paul, right up front here, is telling the people, this is God's message. It doesn't come from me. This is an appalling thing. This is a divine message, a message that comes to you from Jesus about the freedom we have in our Savior Christ. So why should we care about what Paul writes to the Galatians years and years ago? Well, first of all, we should care because what the Judaizers did, people are still doing today. They are still trying to add something to that freedom that we have in Christ. Sometimes they add it by saying, well, you... Believe in Jesus, but that won't get you saved. You have to believe in Jesus and you have to live a certain kind of life. That will help you to be saved. 
or there has to be a certain character in you. And if you don't have that character, then you can't be saved. It's not enough that Jesus died for your sins. You have to do something in order to be saved. But you see, when they add that and deny that Jesus has completely and fully forgiven us, what does it do to our salvation? It makes it uncertain. We begin to doubt. We begin to be filled with fear because we're not sure whether we've done enough, whether our life has been good enough for God. But you notice when Paul begins his letter, what does he say to them? He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice that he calls Jesus our Lord? When you and I think of Lord, we tend to have a servile attitude towards that name. In other words, we think he's Lord and I'm the servant, I'm slave. But that's not the way the Old Testament uses that name. In the Old Testament, that's that special name for our God that he gives to himself. It's a title that he uses of himself. And when he uses it, he wants to refer to himself as the Savior God. It's a name that means he's the one who redeemed us. It means that he loves us. It shows us his faithfulness to us as the God of grace and mercy. And so when Paul says, Jesus Christ, our Lord here, he's referring to the fact that Jesus is our redeemer. He's the one who's rescued us and saved us. And he saved us in order to give us wealth and riches that we can't even imagine. And among that wealth and riches that Jesus has won for us is the grace and peace that we have with God our Father. And why do we have that grace and peace with God our Father? Paul says, because Jesus is the one who gave himself for our sins. That's key. Jesus is our substitute. The sins that we had by nature, that demanded that we be punished, that demanded that we give our life eternally into hell. Jesus took them on himself, took them completely away from us so that we are at peace with God, that God isn't angry at us, that we don't stand before him as slaves shuddering, but as free people in our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the key to all of the gospel. The gospel is about our freedom from our sins. And that freedom is free, but it was not cheap. It cost the very life, our Savior, Jesus Christ. But when he gave his life, that life was so valuable and so complete that his satisfaction of our sins, that his payment, that his rescue was absolutely complete, done. Paul tells us that he rescued us from this present evil world. Literally, the word there could be translated, he ripped us out of this present evil world. He took us out of all of its condemnation, all of its sin, all of the control it had over us. And he did that because that was God's will, and it was God's will all along. God always wanted us to have a wonderful relationship with us, with him. He wanted us to be close to him, to not have any fear of him as he was in our presence. But as we heard earlier today, Adam and Eve ruined all of that, spoiled it in the Garden of Eden. But instead of casting us off, instead of saying, I've, I've had it with you, God instead gave a promise, a promise that he would send his son who would crush that serpent, who would tie up that strong man so that he could plunder all of the the people that he had gathered and slaves under his control. And Jesus, through his death, ripped us free from this present evil world. A world which enslaves us with its, its reason and its way of thinking. A world which enslaves us to, to money and fame as if that could bring us any kind of blessing eternally. Instead, rips us out to bring us into his kingdom. A kingdom where we right now have freedom in a kingdom where we have freedom for eternity because of Jesus, our Savior. 
That's why it's important for us to study the book of Galatians. And Paul's going to have a lot more to say about that as we look at this book. This is just the tip of the iceberg today. But there's another reason why it's important for us to study Galatians. Because of what Paul says right at the beginning. And that's that this isn't Paul's word. This is God's word. This is God's message to us about the gospel of freedom. And if God says anything to us, we ought to listen to it. Because we're just like those Galatians. We struggle in this life. And we need to hear again and again the freedom that we have in Christ. And so we are going to take time this summer to become very familiar with this book of Galatians so that we know that we are free. If we lose that freedom, then we are lost eternally. Who says so? God says so. Amen. Please stand. We'll join now in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed printed for you in your worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we have the opportunity in our Christian freedom to offer our gifts of love to our God to support the spreading of the gospel through this congregation and through our synod that we are joined with. You may do that either by putting your gifts in the basket as you leave our chapel today or using the online versions that are available to you as indicated in your worship folder. We now continue our service today with the singing of our next hymn, number 754, The Tree of Life.
Please stand. In our Christian freedom, we also have the opportunity to go right into God's throne of grace with our prayers. And so we pray, first of all, our prayer of the church, and after that, we join in praying our Lord's Prayer as printed in your worship folders. Let us bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, who created us as your perfect people, but who watched as your people turned their backs on you in the Garden of Eden and entered into a slavery that would keep them captive to this world's thinking and ways and finally to death. We praise you today and thank you that you have brought to us this message of freedom in Jesus Christ, our Savior, that you have freed us from the fear of death. You have freed us from the guilt of sins. You have freed us to serve you without fear because we know that Jesus has brought us into a new relationship with you. We thank you that you are at peace with us. We ask you through this gospel to keep us at peace with you, O Lord, to never forget that we are your dear children and to live with you as our dear Father. Draw us ever closer to your perfect goodness, O Lord, that we may share in your glory through Jesus our Savior. We praise you today also, good and gracious Father in heaven, that this coming week it appears that we will go back to some little bit of normalcy in our world after more than a year of the terror and slavery of this disease called COVID-19. Help us remember, O oh Lord, that you are the one who is the source of the blessings that we have received. It is you who have given people the ability to, to create the vaccines and to, to slow the spread of this virus. Help us to trust in you in the future and to give you the glory as we enjoy our freedom again in this country. Help us to live in the freedom of Jesus as we serve one another in this new freedom, showing our love for others as you showed your love for us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would gather all of our members back again to this house of worship to praise you and to serve you with their voices and their money and their service of their time and abilities so that we may both praise you and spread your holy gospel, the gospel of freedom to a world that is still so enslaved and needs to know they are free. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus. And in his name, we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We close our service with our final hymn, number 155, Christ the Lord is risen again. You may be seated.
Welcome again to you all to worship at Zion today. A special welcome to you also who are watching our live stream. We're glad that you were able to join us. If you are a guest, we ask you to please let us know that you joined us and join us again in the future. Again, I'll remind you that next Sunday may look a little bit different. We'll see what happens, but uh, that will be communicated to you in some way before next Sunday. A couple things to call your attention to besides just reading the announcements in the worship folder for yourself. One is, don't forget that there is a Wells Connection for June that you can watch. The link is on the electronic worship folder, or you can just type those, uh, that link into your web uh, browser, and it'll take you to that June Wells Connection. We're not showing it right now because it doesn't go across the live stream very well. So do watch that for yourself and keep yourself abreast of what's going on in our synod and be encouraged by what other Christians are also doing. Secondly, we begin our Wednesday evening Bible class uh, again this Wednesday evening. Uh, we will be doing it virtually, and we will continue to do it virtually for the time being. So do uh, take the time to join us for that. It's a good time of hearing God's Word. We usually study one of the readings that we've had on Sunday morning uh, and expand on it a little bit so that we can gain insights into what the Word of God is saying. Thirdly, I uh, would like to call your attention to the fact that there is a flower chart that Cindy has now put up downstairs on the bulletin board, so we can again sign up for flowers if you'd like to have a special occasion noted and put flowers on our altar to beautify our worship service, you can do that. And refreshments are up there down there too now, so when we're able to start those refreshments, uh, we also will sometime in the near future be beginning a Bible class on Sunday mornings, but again, watch for announcements. We'll let you know that after we make the decision exactly when that's going to happen this coming week. Those are all the announcements for today. May the Lord be with you and keep you in your Christian freedom. <laughs>